Act One of The Schoolmistress by Arthur Wing Pinero. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Schoolmistress, a Farce in Three Acts by Arthur Wynne Pinero. The Persons of the Play. The Honorable Vera Cricket, read by Peter Tucker. Miss Diod of Alumnia College for Daughters of Gentlemen. Read by Sonia. Admiral Rankling of Her Majesty's Flagship Pandora. Read by Son of the Exiles. Mrs. Rankling. Read by Abayi. Dinah. Read by Lian Yao. Mr. Reginald Parlover. Read by Thomas Peter. Peggy Hesleridge. An articled pupil. Read by Eva Davis. Lieutenant John Mallory. Of Her Majesty's flagship Pandora. Read by Nemo. Mr. Saunders. Mr. Mallory's nephew of the training ship Dextrous. Read by Chuck Williamson. Gwendolyn Hawkins. Read by Kieran Metz. Ermintrude Johnson. Read by Kalinda. Otto Bernstein. A popular composer. Read by Alan Mapstone. Tyler. A servant. Read by Rob Board. Jane Chapman. Read by Iki Tavi. Goff. Read by Recording Person. Jeffrey. Read by Sandra Schmidt. Stage Directions. Read by Todd. Act One. The Mystery. The scene is the reception room at Miss Diot's Seminary for Young Ladies, known as Volumnia College, Volumnia House, near Portland Place. The windows look on to the street, and a large door at the further end of the room opens to the hall, where there are some portmanteaus standing, while there is another door on the spectator's right. Jane Chipman, a stout, middle-aged servant, and Tyler, an unhealthy-looking youth wearing a page's jacket, enter the room, carrying between them a large travelling trunk. Old Ard! Old Ard! Oh, phew! They rest the trunk on the floor. Tyler dabs his forehead with a small, dirty handkerchief, which he passes on to Jane. Excuse me for not offering it to you first, Jane. Jane, dabbing the palms of her hands. Don't know me, Tyler. Do you happen to know what time this starts? Two thirty, I heard say. It's a queer thing, uh, going away like this alone. Not to say nothing of a schoolmistress leaving a lot of foolish young girls for a month or six weeks. Tyler, sitting despondently on the trunk. Cook and the parlour maid got rid of too. It's not much of a Christmas vacation we shall get you and me, Jane. You're right. Sitting on the sofa. Let's see. I mean, if our young ladies haven't gone on for their holidays. Well, there's Miss Hawkins. Our people is in India. Miss Johnson. Our people is in the divorce court. Miss Hesslerig. Oh, she ain't got no home. She's an orphan, studying for to be a governess. Then there's this new girl, Miss Ranklin. Dana Ranklin. Yes, Dina Ranklin. Now why is she to spend her Xmas at our college? She's the daughter of Admiral Ranklin, and the Ranklins live just round the corner at Collinwood House. Oh, she's been falling in love or something, and has got to be locked up. Well then, last but not least, there's the individual who is kicking his heels about the house and giving himself the airs of the haughty. Jane, mysteriously. What? Mrs. Husband? Yes, Mrs. His Husband. Ah, mark my word. If ever there was a mystery, there's one. Who is he? Mrs. brings him home about a month ago and doesn't introduce him to us or to nobody. The order is she's still to be called Miss Diet, and we don't know even his nasty name. Jane, returning to the trunk. She calls him Ducky. Yes, but we can't call him Ducky. Pointing to the handkerchief which Jane has left upon the sofa. My handkerchief, please. 
I don't let anybody use it. Jane, returning the handkerchief. Excuse me. In putting the handkerchief into his breast pocket, he first removes a handful of cheap-looking squibs. No, you are carrying deadly fireworks about with you, Tyler. Tyler, regarding them fondly. Fireworks is my only dissipation. There ain't much danger unless anybody lunges at me. Producing some dirty crackers from his trousers' pockets, and regarding them with gloomy relish. Friction is the risk I run. Jane, palpitating. Oh, don't, Tyler. I can have such an anchoring. Tyler, intensely. It's more than an anchoring. I love to order them and meller them. Today they're damp, tomorrow they're dry, and when the time comes for me to let them off. Then they don't go up? Tyler, putting the fireworks away. Perhaps not. And it's their horrible uncertainty what I crave after. Lift your end, Jane. They take up the trunk as Gwendolyn Hawkins and Ermatrude Johnson, two pretty girls, the one gushing, the other haughty in manner, appear in the hall. Here are Miss Dyot's boxes. She is really going today. I am so happy. What an inexpressible relief. Oh, Tyler, I am dissatisfied with the manner in which my shoes are polished. Yes, and, Tyler, you never fed my mice last night. It ain't my place. Birds and mice is Jane's place. Oh, you are an inhuman boy. Shaking Tyler. You are a creature. Don't shake him, miss. Don't shake him. Peggy Hesleridge enters through the hall and comes between Tyler and Glendlin. Peggy is a shabbily dressed, untidy girl with wild hair and inky fingers. Her voice is rather shrewish and her actions are jerky. Altogether, she has the appearance of an overwise and neglected child. Leave the boy alone, Gwendolyn Hawkins. What has he done? He won't feed my darling pets. And he is generally a lower order. Go away, Tyler. Tyler and Jane deposit the trunk in the hall with the other baggage and disappear. You silly girls. To make an enemy of the boy at the very moment we depend upon his devotion. It's just like you, Ermintrude Johnson. Don't you threaten me with your inky finger, Miss Hesleriga, please. Ugh. Haven't we sworn to help Dinah Rankling with our last breath? Haven't we sworn to free her from the chains of tyranny and oppression, and never to eat much until we've seen her safely and happily by her husband's side? Yes, but we can't truckle to a pale and stumpy boy, you know. We can. We've got to. If Dinah's husband is ever to enter this house, we must crouch before the instrument who opens the door, however short, however pasty. Dinah, calling outside. Are you there, girls? Peggy, jumping and clapping her hands. Here's Dinah. Dinah! Dinah. They run up to the door to receive and embrace Dinah, who enters through the hall. Dinah is an exceedingly pretty and simple-looking girl of about sixteen. We've been waiting for you, Dinah. And now you're going to keep your promise to us, ain't you? My promise? To tell us all about it from beginning to end. Dinah, bashfully. Oh, I can't. I don't like to. You must. We've only heard your story in bits. But where's Miss Diet? Out. Out. Out! And where is he, Miss Diet's husband? What, the mystery? Skipping across to the left-hand door, and, going down on her knees, peering through the keyhole. It's all right. One o'clock in the day, and he's not down yet. The imp. I'd cold sponge him if I were Miss Diet. Places, young ladies. Ermatrude sits with Dinah on the sofa. Gwendolyn being at Dinah's feet. Peggy perches on the edge of the table with her feet on a chair. <clears throat> now then, Mrs. What's your name, Dinah? Dinah, drooping her eyelids. Pullover. Mrs. Reginald Pullover. Attention for Mrs. Pullover's narrative. Chapter One. Well, dears, I met him at a party at Mrs. St. Dunstan's in the Cromwell Road. He was presented to Mamma and me by Major Padgate. Vote of thanks to Major Padgate. 
i wish we knew him young ladies well i bowed of course and then mr paulover mr paulover asked me whether i didn't think the evening was rather warm he soon began to rattle on then it was his conversation that attracted you i suppose oh no love came very gradually we were introduced at about ten o'clock and i didn't feel really drawn to him till long after eleven the next day being ma's at-home day major padgate brought him to tea young ladies what is your opinion of major padgate i think he must be awfully considerate he's not he called my reginald a young shaver that's contemptible enough how old is your reginald he is much my senior he was seventeen in november well the following week reginald proposed to me in the conservatory he spoke very sensibly about settling down and how we were not growing younger and how he'd seen a house in park lane which wasn't to let but which very likely would be to let some day and then we went into the drawing-room and told mamma well well, well? well? dinah breaking down and putting her handkerchief to her eyes oh i shall never forget the scene i never shall don't cry dinah they all tried to console her mamma who is very delicate went into violent hysterics and tore the hearth rug with her teeth but a day or two afterwards she grew a little calmer and promised to write to papa who was with a ship at malta and did she yes papa you know is admiral rankling his ship the pandora has never run into anything and so papa is a very distinguished man and what was his answer he telegraphed home one terrible word bosh oh oh, oh. he ought to be struck into a flying dutchman the telegraphic rate for malta necessitates abruptness but i can never forgive the choice of such a phrase but it decided our fate three weeks ago when i supposed to be selecting walls at whiteley's reginald and i were secretly united at the registry office oh how lovely how romantic we declared we were much older than we really are but as reginald said trouble had aged us so it wasn't a story at the doors of the registry office we parted how horrible i couldn't have done that and when i reached home there was a letter from papa ordering mamma to have me locked up at once in a boarding school and here i am torn from my husband my letters opened by miss diet quite friendless and alone no that you're not dinah listen to me miss diet is going out of town to-day and i'm left in charge i'm a poor governess but playing jailer over bleeding hearts is not in my articles and if your husband comes to volumnia house and demands his wife he doesn't go away without you does he young ladies no, no. we will do as we would be done by won't we yes, yes. the street door bell is heard the girls cling to each other oh 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 dinah trembling miss diet tyler is seen crossing the hall peggy runs to the window and looks out no it isn't it's the postman a letter from reginald tyler enters with three letters peggy sweetly anything for us tyler dear tyler looking at the letters which he guards with one arm one for miss dina ranklin oh snatching at her letter which tyler quickly slips into his pocket my orders is to hand miss ranklin's letters to the missus handing a letter to peggy miss hesslerig peggy surprised for me tyler looking at the third letter oh look here here's a go what's, what's that? that tyler dancing with delight oh crikey this must be for him miss diot's husband the, the mystery. mystery the girls gather round tyler and look over his shoulder peggy reading the address it's re-addressed from the junior amalgamated club st james street snatching the letter from tyler gracious the honourable veer quecket the honourable the honourable what's that mean young ladies we have been entertaining a swell unawares returning the letter to tyler take it up swell or no swell the person who soils two pairs of boots per diem daily is no friend of mine tyler goes out 
Peggy, opening her letter. Oh, from Dinah's Reginald. No, no. Addressed to me. Referring to the signature. Reginald Percy Palover. Read it, read it. Peggy sits on the sofa, the three girls clustering round her, Dinah kneeling at her feet expectantly. Peggy, reading. Montpellier Square, West Brompton. Dear Miss Hesleridge, heaven will reward you. The letter wrapped round a stone which you threw me last night from an upper window of Volumnia House was handed to me after I had compensated the person upon whose head it unfortunately alighted. The news that Dinah has one friend in Volumnia House enabled me to get a little rest between half past five and six this morning. One friend. What about us? Dinah kisses them. Go on. Peggy, reading. Not having closed my eyes for eleven nights, sleep was of distinct value. Now, dear Miss Hesleridge, inform Dinah that our apartments are quite ready. Oh. oh. And that I shall present myself at Volumnia College to fetch away the dear love of my heart tonight at half past nine. Tonight. 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 Oh, I've come over so frightened. Tonight. Waving the letter and dancing round with delight. Finish the letter. Peggy, resuming her seat and reading with emotion. Please assure Dinah that I shall love her till death and that the piano is now moving in. Dinah is my one thought. The former is on the three years system. Kiss my angel for me. Our carpet is Axminster and I regret to say second hand. But oh. Our life will be a blessed, blessed dream, the worn part going well under the center table. This evening at half past nine, gratefully yours, Reginald Percy Pallover. P.S. I shall be closely muffled up, as the corner lamp post under which I stand is visible from the window of Admiral Rankling's dining room. You will know me by my faithful, trusty respirator. Oh, I'm so excited! I wish somebody was coming for me. I know. We shall be frustrated by Jane. Or Tyler. Leave them to me. I'll manage them. But there's Miss Dyett's husband. What? Let the mysterious person who has won Miss Dyett pause before he steps between a young bride and a bridegroom. Ladies, Miss Dyett's husband is ours for the holidays. One frown from him, and his dinner shall be wrecked his wine watered, his cigars dampened. He shall find us not girls, but gorgons. A loud knock and ring are heard at the front door. Jane crosses the hall. Ermatrude, Gwendolyn, and Dinah, under their breath, Miss Dyot! Miss Dyot! They quickly disappear. Peggy remains, hastily concealing the letter. Miss Dyot enters. She is a good-looking, dark woman of dignified presence and rigid demeanor, her dress and manner being those of the typical schoolmistress. Is that Miss Hesleridge? Peggy, demurely. Yes, Miss Dyot. How have the young ladies been employing themselves? I have been reading aloud to them, Miss Dyot. Is Mr. Que... is my husband down yet? I've not had the pleasure of seeing him, Miss Dyot. You can join the young ladies. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Dyot. In the doorway, she waves Reginald's letter defiantly, but quickly disappears as Miss Dyot turns around. Now if Vere will only remain upstairs a few moments longer. She goes hurriedly to the left-hand door, listens, and turns the key, then to the center door, listens again, and appears satisfied, after which she throws open the window and waves her handkerchief, calling in a loud whisper, Mr. Bernstein, Mr. Bernstein, I have left the door on the latch. Come in, please. Closing the window and going to the door. Very shortly afterwards, Otto Bernstein, a little elderly German with the air of a musician, enters the room. Thank you for following me so quickly. Closing the door and turning the key. You seem so agitated that i came after your cab mit another agitated yes 
tell me miserable woman that i am tell me what did i sound like at rehearsal this morning capital capital your voice comes out rich and beautiful mark my word you will make a hit to-night have you seen your new name in the pills the pills the play pills i should drop flat on the pavement if i did it looks very fine quoting miss constance stella port as queen honorine in otto bernstein's new gomic opera pierrette her first appearance in london oh how disgraceful disgraceful to sing such melodies no no please disgraceful why did you appeal to me three weeks ago to put you in the way of getting through the christmas vacation miss diot tearfully oh you don't know everything sit down i can trust you you are my oldest friend and were a pupil of my late eminent father mr bernstein i am no longer a single woman oh i am very pleased i wish you many happy returns of the eh, no i congratulate you i am married secretly secretly because my husband could never face the world of fashion as the consort of the proprietors of a scholastic establishment you will gather from this that my husband is a gentleman hmm so is he it had been a long cherished ambition with me if ever i married to wed no one but a gentleman i do not mean a gentleman in a mere parliamentary sense i mean a man of birth blood and breeding respect my confidence i have wedded the honourable veer quacket bernstein unconcernedly ah uh, is he a very nice man nice mr bernstein you are speaking of a brother of lord limehouse oh am i lord limehouse let me think he is very very what you call it very popular just now yeah yeah he is in the bankruptcy courts miss diot with pride certainly so is harold archidec and quacket veer's youngest brother so is loftus martineau quacket veer's cousin they have always been a very united family but dear mr bernstein you have accidentally probed the one i won't say fault the one most remarkable attribute of these great saxon quackets oh yes i see you have to pay your husband's little pills quite so that is it i have the honour of being employed in the gradual discharge of liabilities incurred by mr veer quacket since the year eighteen seventy six i am also engaged in the noble task of providing mr quacket with the elaborate necessities of his present existence i know now why you wanted mine help ah yes volumnia college is not equal to the grand duty imposed upon it it is absolutely necessary that i should increase my income in my despair at facing this genial season i wrote to you proposing to turn your capital voice to account eh quite so and suggesting that i should sing in your new oratorio well you are going to do so what when you have induced me to figure in a comic opera yeah yeah but i have told you i have used the music of my new oratorio for my new comic opera ah oh, yes that is my only consolation will your good gentleman be in the stalls to-night in the stalls at the theatre hush mr bernstein it is a secret from veer lest his suspicions should be aroused by my leaving home every evening 
i have led him to think that i am visiting a clergyman's wife at hereford i shall really be lodging in henrietta street covent garden oh why not tell him all about it oh, nonsense Veer is a gentleman he would insist upon attending me to and from the theatre well i should hope so no no he is himself a graceful dancer a common chord of sympathy would naturally be struck between him and the cory fees oh there is so much variety in veer's character well you are a plucky woman you deserve to be happy some day happy think of the deception i am practising upon dear veer think of the people who believe in the rigid austerity of caroline diod principal of volumnia college think of the precious confidence reposed in me by the parents and relations of twenty-seven innocent pupils give an average of eight and a half relations to each pupil multiply eight and a half by twenty-seven and you approximate the number whose trust i betray this night yes but think of the audience you will delight to-night in my oratorio i mean my comic opera oh that reminds me taking out a written paper from a pocket-book here are two new verses of the political song for you to commit to memory before this evening they are extremely good miss diot looking at the paper mr bernstein surely here is a veiled allusion to yes i thought so oh the unwarrantable familiarity i can't i can't even vocally allude to a perfect stranger as the grand old man oh now now he won't mind that but the tendency of the chorus reading doesn't he wish he may get it is opposed to my stern political convictions oh what am i coming to quacket's voice is heard quacket calling outside caroline caroline <gasps> yes veer hurriedly to bernstein good-bye dear mr bernstein you understand why i cannot present you bernstein bustling good-bye till to-night mark my word you will make a great hit caroline miss diot unlocking the centre door go let yourself out good luck to you miss diot opening the door yes yes and success to my new oratorio i, I mean my comic opera oh go she pushes him out and closes the door leaning against it faintly Quacket, rattling the other door. I say, Caroline! Miss Diot, calling to him. Is that my darling Veer? Yes! She comes to the other door, unlocks and opens it. Veer, Quacket, enters. He is a fresh, breezy, dapper little gentleman of about forty-five, with fair curly hair, a small waxed mustache, and a simple boyish manner. He is dressed in the height of fashion, and wears a flower in his coat, and an eyeglass. Good morning, Caroline. Good morning. How is my little pet today? Kisses his cheek, which he turns to her for the purpose. Not if he is down later than usual. It isn't my fault, dear. The florist was late in sending my flower. What a shame. Quacket, shaking out a folded silk handkerchief. By the by, Carrie, I want some fresh perfume in my bottles. My Veer shall have it. Thank you. Thank you. Sitting before the fire, opening the newspaper, and humming a tune. Let me see, let me see. Uh, here we are. Court of bankruptcy, before the official receiver. Limehouse came up again for hearing yesterday. How they bother him. They bothered me in 75 now here's a coincidence carrie in 1875 my assets were nil in 1885 dear old bob's assets are nil now that's deuced funny Via dear have you forgotten what today is quacket referring to the head of paper 
december the twenty-second yes but it's the day on which i am to quit my veery oh you stuck to going then well i dare say you're right you know you've a very bad cold nothing like change for a bad cold change of scene change of pocket handkerchiefs and so on but you don't say anything about your own lonely christmas i have married a man who is too unselfish the centre door opens slightly and the heads of the three girls peggy gwendolen and ermatrude appear one above the other spying quacket putting down his paper lonely by jove these inquisitive pupils of yours won't let a fellow be lonely upon my soul they are vexing girls but they are a source of income dear they are a source of annoyance i've never had the measles i've half a mind to catch it and give it to em now if i could only while away my evening somewhere these vexing girls wouldn't so much matter he rises the heads disappear and the door closes listening what was that the front door i think i thought it might be those vexing girls they're always prying about i was going to say carrie why not let me withdraw my resignation at the junior amalgamated club and continue my membership ten guineas a year for such an object i cannot afford and will not pay veer upon my soul i might just as well be nobody the way i'm treated oh my king don't say that have you thought about the christmas expenses frankly my dear i have not have you forgotten that my rent is due on friday completely and then think only think of your boots oh dash it all what man of any position ever thinks of his boots producing a letter the fact is caroline i have had a note sent on to me from the club by my friend jack mallory he's first lieutenant on the pandora you know and just home after four years at malta he reached london yesterday and writes me reading now old chap do let's have one of our old rollicking nights together and what eh correcting himself he writes me referring to the letter now old chap do let me give you the details of our new self-loading eighty-ton gun well carrie what the deuce am i to do it seems a nice gun she shrugs her shoulders carrie what is your veer to do she makes no answer he approaches her and touches her on the shoulder carrie carrie look at your veer veer speaks to you he sits on her lap she looks up affectionately carrie darling you know old jack is such a devil eh a nice devil you know an exceedingly nice devil now i can't show up at the club after sending in my resignation they'd quiz me awfully but i must entertain poor old jack coaxingly eh resignation sent in through misunderstanding eh pinching her cheek ten little guinea winnies eh not a guinea winnie for a club not half a guinea winnie caroline you forget what is due to me i wish i could forget what is due to everybody don't be cross veer i'll fetch your head and coat and veer shall go out for his little morning stroll and if he promises not to be angry with his caroline there are five shillings to spend she gives him some silver he looks up beamingly again my darling miss diot taking his face between her hands and kissing him oh you spoiled boy she runs out what am i to do about jack i can't ask him here carrie would never allow it and if she would i couldn't stand the chaff about marrying a boarding school no i can't ask jack here why can't i ask jack here everybody in bed at nine o'clock square the boy tyler to wait bachelor lodgings near portland place extremely good address jack shall give me the details of that eighty-ton gun 
Yes, and we'll load it, too. While I'm out, I'll send this wire to Jack. Quackett, taking a telegraph form from the stationery cabinet and writing, Come up tonight, dear old boy. 9.30 sharp. Diggings of humble bachelor. 80 Duke Street, Portland Place. Bring two or three good fellows. Veer. How much does that come to? Counting the words rapidly. One, two, three, four, five. No. Getting confused. One, two, two, three, four, five, six. No. One, two, three, four, five, six. Counting to the end. I think it is one and something halfpenny, but it's all luck under the new regulations. Oh, and I haven't addressed it. Where's Jack's letter? He takes the letter from his pocket. Peggy enters quietly. Seeing Quecket, she draws back, watching him. Peggy, to herself. What is he doing now, the guy fox? Quecket, referring to the letter. Ah, Rover's Club. Addressing the telegram. John Mallory, Rover's Club. Let me see. That's in Green Street, Piccadilly. Writing. Green Street, Piccadilly. Or am I thinking of the stragglers? I've a club list upstairs. I'll go and look at it. Humming an air, he shuts up the telegraph form in the blotting book and rises, still with his back to Peggy. <laughs> I feel so happy. He goes out. Peggy advances to the blotting book, carrying some luggage labels. Miss Dyot has sent me to address her luggage labels. I am compelled to open that blotting book. She sits on the chair lately vacated by Quecket, and opens the blotting book mischievously with her forefinger and thumb. Seeing the telegraph form, Ah! Reading it greedily with exclamations, Oh, dear old boy! Oh, diggings of humble bachelor! Oh, bring two or three good fellows! Oh, oh! sticking the telegraph form prominently against the stationery cabinet, facing her, and addressing a luggage label. Miss Dyot, passenger to Hereford. Quackett, re-entering gaily. It is in Green Street, Piccadilly. He sees Peggy and stands perplexed, twisting his little mustache. Peggy, writing solemnly. Miss Dyot. Passenger to Hereford. Quackett, coughing anxiously. <coughs> I fancy I've left an eighty-ton gun. I mean, I think I've mislaid a... Um... Without looking up, Peggy readjusts the telegraph form against the cabinet. Oh, <laughs> that's it. He makes one or two fidgety attempts to take it, when Peggy rises with it in her hand. She reads it silently, forming the words with her lips. Oh, you vexing girl! What do you think of doing about it? She commences to fold the form very neatly. You know I shan't send it. I never meant to send it. I say I shall not send it. Nervously holding out his hand. Shall I? Peggy doubles up the form into another fold without speaking. You are a vexing girl! Miss Dyot, calling outside. Miss Hesloridge. Peggy quietly slips the telegraph form into her pocket. Oh, you won't tell my wife. You will not dare to tell my wife. Will you? Miss Dyot calling again. Miss Hesloridge. Quacket in agony. Oh! Between his teeth. Do you... Do you know any bad language? I went to the Lord Mayor's show once. I heard a little. Then I regret to say I use it to you, Miss Hesselrig. I use it to you. Miss Dyot enters, carrying Quackett's hat, gloves, and overcoat. You can address the labels in another room, Miss Hesselrig, please. Quackett, to himself. 
Will she tell? Peggy to herself. He is in our power. Peggy goes out. Miss Diot, putting the hat on Quackett's head. You look sickly, my dear. I shall be better after my stroll, Carolyn. A knock and ring are heard. Miss Diot, assisting Quackett with his overcoat. As you have some solitary evenings before you, you may lay in a few cigars, dear darling. Thank you, Carrie. Miss Diot, helping him to put on his gloves like a child. But for the sake of our depressed native industries, I beg that you will order those of purely British origin and manufacture. Tyler enters, carrying a large common black tea tray upon which is a solitary visiting card. Where's the salver, you bad boy? Tyler, pointing to Quackett sullenly. He slopped his chocolate over it. Miss Diot, taking the card. Admiral and Mrs. Ranklin. Dinah's parents. I must see them. Quackett, hastily turning up his collar to conceal his face. No, no! They know me! They're old friends of my family's. Tyler shows in Admiral and Mrs. Rankling. Mrs. Rankling is a thin, weak-looking, faded lady, with a pale face and anxious eyes. She is dressed in too many colors, and nothing seems to fit very well. Admiral Rankling is a stout, fine old gentleman, with short, crisp gray hair and fierce black eyebrows. He appears to be suffering inwardly from intense anger. My dear Mrs. Rankling. The ladies shake hands. Tyler goes out. Mrs. Rankling, pointing to Rankling. This is Admiral Rankling. Miss Diot bows ceremoniously. Rankling returns a slight bow and glares at her. Miss Diot to Mrs. Rankling. Pray sit by the fire. As the ladies move to the fire, Quackett, who has been watching his opportunity, creeps round at the back and goes out. Mrs. Rankling, warming her feet at the fire. The Admiral has called upon you, Miss Diot, with reference to our child, Dina. Rankling, with a smothered explanation of rage, sits on the sofa. Whom we find the charming daughter of charming parents. Rankling gives her a fierce look, which frightens Miss Diot, who is most anxious to conciliate the Admiral. Dina's obstinacy is a very serious shock to the Admiral, who is naturally unused to insubordination. Naturally. Rankling glares at her again. She puts her hand to her heart. The Admiral has been stationed with his ship at Malta for a long period. In fact, the Admiral has not brightened our home for over four years. How more than delightful to have him with you again. Rankling gives Miss Diot a fearful look. She clutches her chair. The Admiral has one of those fine English tempers. Generous but impetuous. You may guess the sad impression Dina's ingratitude has produced upon him. It is an open secret that the Admiral made three wills yesterday and read King Lear's curse after supper in place of thanksgiving. Rankling, sharply. Emma! Mrs. Rankling, starting. Yes, Archibald? Live the fire. You'll be chilled when we go. Come over here. Yes, Archibald. Crossing the room in a flutter, and sitting beside Rankling, who makes insufficient room for her. Thank you, Archibald. I have been sitting up with the Admiral all night, and it is owing to my entreaties that he has consented to give Dina one last chance of reconciliation. Rankling, who has been eyeing her. Emma! Yes, Archibald? Your bonnet's on one side again. Mrs. Rankling, adjusting it. Thank you, Archibald. We leave town for the holidays tomorrow. It rests with Dina whether she spends Christmas in her papa's society or not. Don't twitch your fingers, Emma. Don't twitch your fingers. Mrs. Rankling, nervously. It's a habit, Archibald. That's a very bad one. 
all we require is that dina should personally assure us that she has banished every thought of the foolish young gentleman she met at mrs st dunstan's miss diot rising and ringing the bell if i am any student of the passing fancies of a young girl's mind speak louder madam your voice doesn't travel miss diot nervously with a gulp <laughs> if i am any student of the passing fancies rankling puts his hand to his ear oh don't make me so nervous jane enters looking untidy her sleeves turned up and wiping her hands upon her apron miss diot shocked where is the manservant on errand ma'am ask miss dinah rankling to be good enough to step downstairs jane goes out rankling rises with mrs rankling clinging to his arm you will be calm archibald you will be moderate in tone <coughs> oh dear poor dina stop that fidgety cough emma stalking about the room his wife following him even love matches are sometimes very happy our was a love match archibald be quiet where exceptions pacing up to the door just as it opens and peggy presents herself directly rankling sees peggy he catches her by the shoulders and gives her a good shaking admiral archibald peggy being shaken uh, 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 uh. rankling panting and releasing peggy you good-for-nothing girl do you know you've upset your mother archibald that isn't dina that is another young lady rankling aghast what not who who has led me into this unpardonable error of a judgment mrs rankling to peggy who was rubbing her shoulder and looking vindictively at rankling oh my dear young lady pray think of this only as an amusing mistake the admiral has been away for more than four years dina was but a child when he last saw her <sighs> oh dear me be quiet emma you'll make a scene miss diot to peggy where is miss rankling miss rankling presents her compliments to miss diot and her love to her papa and mamma and as her mind is quite made up she would rather not cause distress by granting an interview rankling sinks into a chair archibald miss diot to peggy the port wine peggy advances with the cake and wine mrs rankling kneeling to rankling archibald be yourself remember you have to respond for the navy at a banquet to-night think of your reputation as a genial after-dinner speaker rankling rising with forced calmness thank you emma to miss diot madam my daughter is in your charge till you receive instructions from my solicitor glaring at peggy a short written apology will be sent to this young lady in the course of the afternoon to his wife emma your hair's rough come home he gives mrs rankling his arm they go out miss diot sinks exhausted on sofa peggy offers her a glass of wine oh my goodness declining the wine no no not that it has been decanted since midsummer quacket his coat collar turned up appears at the door looking back over his shoulder what's the matter with the ranklings seeing miss diot and peggy oh has that vexing girl told carola the clock strikes two miss diot to herself two o'clock i must remove to henrietta street seeing quacket my darling my love to himself all right i am going to prepare for my journey the train leaves paddington at three as miss diot goes toward the centre door 
Jane enters, carrying about twenty boxes of cigars, which she deposits on the floor, and then goes out. What is this? Hmm. My cigars, Carrie. Brought them with me in a cab. Oh. Reading the label on one of the boxes. Poor Carolina. Ah, poor Caroline. She goes out. Directly she is gone, Peggy and Quecket, by a simultaneous movement, rush to the two doors and close them. Now, Miss Hazelrig. Sir. We will come to a distinct understanding. If you please. In the first place, you will return me my telegram. I can't. You mean you won't? No, I can't. Why not? I have just sent it to the telegraph office by Tyler. Dispatched it? Dispatched it. It was one and fourpence. Oh, you, you, you vexing girl. Mr. Mallory will be here tonight. Yes, and we'll bring two or three good fellows. At least we hope so. Hope so? Peggy, standing over him with her arms folded. Listen, Mr. Veer Quicket. He starts. We ladies are going to give a little party tonight to celebrate a serious event in the life of one of us. We have invited only one young gentleman. Your friends will be welcome. Oh? Without us, your party must fail, for we command the servants. Let it be a compact. Your soiree shall be our soiree, and our soiree your soiree. And if I indignantly decline? Peggy, solemnly. Consider, Mr. Quackett, your Christmas holidays are to be passed with us. Think in which direction your comfort and freedom lie, in friendship or in enmity. Even now, Ermintrude Johnson is trimming the holly with one of your razors. But what explanation could I give Mr. Mallory of your presence here? Every detail has been considered. You are our bachelor uncle. Uncle? We are your four nieces. Quackett looks up, is tickled by the idea. <laughs> <laughs> I don't see why that shouldn't be rather jolly. Peggy, roguishly. Do you consent? Can't help myself, can I? Peggy, delighted. That you can't. Let's be friends, then, shall we? Have you girls got any money? No. Have you? No. That is, all mine's invested. Miss Diot, outside. Tyler, fetch a cab. Quackett makes a bolt from the room, and Peggy vigorously rearranges the furniture as Miss Diot enters, dressed as if for a journey, and carrying her umbrella and handbag again. Where is my husband? Peggy, looking about her. Your handbag, Miss Diot? Quackett re-enters. Still in your overcoat, dear? Of course, Carrie. I'll drive with you to Paddington. No, no. I insist on going alone. Quackett, taking off his coat with alacrity. Oh, Carrie, I am disappointed. Dinah, Gwendolyn, and Ermatrude come through the hall into the room and form a group. Jane enters the hall. Tyler joins her there. Miss Hesleridge, young ladies, I regret to say I am compelled to... to quit Volumnia House for a time. The length of my absence depends upon how long it runs... Correcting herself in confusion. Upon how long it runs to it, to employ a colloquialism of the vulgar. But I depart with a light heart, because I leave my husband in authority. He will find a trusty lieutenant in Miss Hesleridge. Ladies, to abandon for the moment our mother tongue, je vous embrasse de tout mon cœur. Soyez sage. Au revoir, Mademoiselle Bon voyage, Mademoiselle Peggy joins the girls and they talk earnestly. A cabman is seen carrying out the boxes from the hall, assisted by Tyler. Miss Diot produces some paper packets of money from her handbag. Miss Diot, as she gives the packets to Quackett. Veer, 
the house agent will apply for the rent there it is our fire insurance expired yesterday post the premium to the eagle office at once jane's wages are due next week deduct for the broken water bottle when you need exercise dear one tidy up the backyard the recreation ground a charwoman assists jane on fridays three quarters of a day and leaves before her tea good-bye veer the cabs are waiting ma'am miss diot takes quackett's arm good-bye miss diot good-bye miss diot good-bye miss diot good miss, good miss diot and quackett go out through the hall peggy ermertrude and gwendolen run over to the windows and look out dinah sits apart thinking there they are miss diot's in the cab she's off Quackett returns. The girls surround him demonstratively. Dinah, young ladies. Pointing to Quackett. Uncle Veer. Uncle Veer. Uncle Veer. Quackett tries to maintain his dignity and pushes the girls from him. Tyler, with Jane, is seen letting off a squib in the hall. End of the first act. Act Two of the Schoolmistress by Arthur Wing Pinero. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Second Act The Party. The scene is a plain looking schoolroom of Miss Diot's. Outside the two windows runs a narrow balcony and beyond are seen the upper stories and roofs of the opposite houses. There are two doors facing each other. The room is decorated for the occasion with holly and evergreen, and a table is laid with supper. Peggy is standing on a chair with a large hammer in her hand, nailing up holly. Peggy, surveying her work, There, I'm sure Miss Dyer wouldn't recognize the dull old classrooms. Descending, I think it's time I dressed. Quackett enters slowly. He is in a perfectly fitting evening dress, with a flower in his buttonhole, but looks much depressed. He and Peggy regard each other for a moment silently. Oh, I'm so glad you're ready early. How good it makes one feel giving pleasure to others, doesn't it? Aren't you well? Yes. No. I deeply regret plunging into the vortex of these festivities. Oh, I suppose you're nervous in society. Quackett, drawing himself up. Nervous in society, Miss Hesselrig. What do you think of the decorations? Artistic, aren't they? A treat at a Sunday school. Then you shouldn't have locked up the rooms downstairs. I daren't allow the neighbours to see the house lighted up downstairs. I wish I could have locked up all you vexing girls. That's not the spirit to give a party in. Contemplating the table. How many do you think your friend, Mr. Mallory, will bring? I don't think Mr. Mallory will find his way here at all. Have you observed the fog? Is it foggy? You can't see your hand before you outside. I sincerely hope my friend will not come. There's hospitality. Ours will. Who is your friend? Mr. Pallover. And who the devil is... I don't think that's the language for a party, Mr. Quicket. I beg your pardon. Who is Pallover? Tyler enters with a bill in his hand, with his hair stiffly brushed and greased, and wearing an expression of intense wonderment. What's this? A beautiful large lobster salad is come, sir. Quackett, looking at Peggy. I haven't ordered a lobster salad. In an undertone. You know, this is getting extremely vexing. He takes from his pocket the packets of money previously given to him by Miss Diot. I've already paid a bill for some oysters and a pâté de foie gras. Jane's wages went for that. Opening a packet. Now here's a salad. That breaks into next week's household expenses. Handing the money to Tyler, who goes out. 
we're only girls you know and you seem to forget you're our uncle quacket irritably i am not your uncle tonight you are but you needn't be our uncle tomorrow somebody will have to be my uncle tomorrow then i understand there's a lark pudding ordered for half-past nine i can't allow the account to be sent in to 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 auntie well to to auntie who pays for the lark pudding you couldn't well ask girls to do it besides it's your party it is not my party and it is your lark pudding it may be our lark but it's your pudding tyler enters still much astonished and with another bill quacket taking the bill what's that such a lot of champagne's come sir champagne who ordered that i didn't hush i did i did i did then it is your party part of the party is my party opening another packet i've broken into the rent he hands tyler the bill and some money pocketing the remainder tyler goes out the fire insurance alone remains intact opening the last packet postal orders for thirty shillings i'll dispatch that at any rate he sits at the writing table and begins to write peggy hammers up the last piece of holly as quacket tries to write oh you vexing girl beg pardon this is the last blow she gives another knock as jane enters carrying a large ornamental wedding cake jane is in a black gown and smart cap and apron her eyes are wide open with pleasure and astonishment jane deposits the cake upon the writing table before quacket excuse me sir the confection is just brought for thanks what's that that isn't the lark pudding oh lord no sir she goes out oh that's the wedding cake oh come it isn't my wedding cake oh don't you funny man no it's mr palover's who the dev hush let's settle one thing at a time who is palover dear dinah's husband dear dinah your niece dinah rankling married secretly to mr palover quacket puts his hand to his brow oh that's old palover is it young palover they were married really three weeks ago but without any breakfast i don't mean a bacon breakfast i mean a proper breakfast but we girls think they ought to have a wedding cake and everything complete to start them in life together and that's why you're giving this party you know now understand me i will not be dragged into such a conspiracy but you're in it the ranklings are acquaintances of mine almost relatives admiral rankling's cousin married the sister of the man who bought my brother's horses rubbing his hands together i wash my hands of all you vexing girls don't fret about it please nothing can ever make mrs palover miss rankling again i'll go and dress while you finish your letter Ooh. he resumes writing at the table peggy going to the door the girls will be here directly be nice won't you she goes out jane enters with tarts and confectionery on dishes which she places on the table before quacket excuse me sir Quacket rises with his letter and the inkstand, and goes impatiently over to the other side of the room, where he continues writing on top of the piano. They won't let me write to the insurance office. Tyler enters with some boxes of bonbons. The writing table being crowded, Jane waves him over to the piano and goes out. Tyler puts the bonbons on the top of the piano before Quacket, who snatches up his letter and the inkstand again, and goes to the center table i will write to the insurance office tyler goes out as jane re-enters jane presenting a bill the pastry cook's bill sir great scott diving his hand into his pocket bringing out some loose money and giving it to jane there jane goes out 
I've written to the insurance office. Sealing the letter. My mind's easy. Done my duty to poor Carolyn. He puts the letter in his breast pocket as Tyler enters. Tyler, more astonished than ever, announcing, Miss Gwendolyn Hawkins. Gwendolyn enters, dressed in a simple and pretty party dress. Tyler goes out. Gwendolyn, bashfully, seeing nobody but Quecket. Oh, I'm first. I shall come back again. She is going. Come in, come in. How do you do? Gwendolyn advances. Quecket shakes hands with her. Delighted to see you. So glad you've come. Won't you sit down? To himself with satisfaction. Illustrations of deportment and the restrictions of society. Veer Quecket. Carrie would be delighted. Tyler re-enters, still more astonished. Miss Hermintrude Johnson and, and, and Mrs. Reginald Paulover. This is a little too vexing. Ermatrude and Dinah enter, both prettily dressed. Dinah in white. Tyler goes out. How do you do? So glad you've come. Won't you sit down? We're very well, thank you. Awfully well. They sit, the three girls in a row. Dinah in the center, Gwendolyn and Ermatrude taking her hands. Quecket, to himself. Instructions in polite conversation. Brusquely to Dinah. How is Paul over? Oh, I think he's very well, thank you. Quecket, to himself. Carrie would be pleased. To the girls. Hmm. I suppose you young ladies distinctly understand that I occupy a painfully false position this evening. I am sure it is very, very kind of you to give this party. Quecket, to himself. Well, now, that's exceedingly appropriate, the way in which that is put. Carrie really does do her duty to the parents of these girls. Peggy says you insist on our calling you uncle. Does she? To himself. Peggy is the one I've turned against. We think you'll be an awfully jolly uncle. Quacket, pleased. Thank you. Thank you. To himself. I begin to like helping Carrie with the pupils. Peggy enters. She is quaintly but untidily dressed in poor, much-worn, and old-fashioned finery. In her hand she carries a pair of soiled, long white gloves. Hello. Without speaking a word, Peggy hurries across the room and goes out. What is the matter with that vexing girl now? Peggy re-enters with Tyler, pushing him forward. Tyler, announcing, Miss Margaret Hesslerig. Peggy advances to Quecket, holding out her hand. How do you do? Quecket, savagely. How do you do? Delighted to see you. For goodness sake, sit down. He turns away to the fire. The three girls rise to greet Peggy. Dinah, anxiously. I don't think it's nearly half past nine yet. Peggy, rather proudly, produces a huge old-fashioned watch. Twenty to ten. I thought it was. Dinah, Gwendolyn, and Ermatrude run to one window, pull aside the blind, and look out. Peggy goes to the other window, pulls up the blind, and opens the window. What are you doing? I can just see him under his lamp post. The fog will hurt him. Hush, I told him we'd whistle twice. Do it. <laughs> Girls, it's ominous. My whistle has left me. To Quecket, taking his arm. Come and whistle. No! No! Peggy, leading Quecket to the open window. Whistle, or you'll catch cold. Quecket whistles twice, desperately. <whistles> then returns to the fireplace, annoyed. He's heard it. She closes the window and pulls down the blind. Now, listen. To Gwendolyn and Ermatrude. You two girls, count five. One. Two. Oh, how slowly you count. Three. Four. Dinah, clasping her hands. Five. 
There is a distant ring at the bell. With a little cry, Dinah runs out. Peggy begins to put her gloves on. Ermatrude and Gwendolyn go to the door, open it, and listen. Peggy, to quack it. Thank you for whistling. I shall never make a whistling woman, shall I? A wide knowledge of humanity, in its highest and lowest grades, Miss Hesselrig, does not enable me even to conjecture the possibilities of your future. No compliments, please. Thank you. She holds out her gloved hand for him to button the glove. After a look of astonishment, he complies. You know my idea about my future, don't you? No. That I only need one essential to become a duchess. What is that? A duke. They're coming upstairs. Peggy, to quack it. Now you'll see Mr. Pollover. Oh, I do hope he'll take to you. Well, really, I'm... He walks angrily away as Dinah enters with Reginald Pollover, a good-looking lad, rather sheepish when in repose, but fiery and demonstrative when out of temper. He is in evening dress, overcoat, and muffler, and wears a respirator, which he removes on entering. Dinah, introducing the three girls. Reggie, these are my three dear friends. Miss Hawkins, Miss Johnson. Reginald, bowing. Awfully pleased to meet you. And Miss Hesselrig. Peggy advances and shakes hands with Reginald. Thank you very much for being so kind to my wife. Ermatrude, to Gwendolyn, disappointed. No whiskers or mustache? Oh. Peggy. To Reginald. Had you been waiting long? Ten minutes. I was jolly glad to hear my wife's dear little whistle. I should know it from a thousand. <clears throat> Dinah, dear, make Mr. Pollover and Mr. Quackett known to each other. Quackett comes forward with a disagreeable look. Reginald glares at him. Dinah, timidly. Reggie, dear, this is Mr. Quackett. Quackett bows stiffly. Reginald nods angrily. Reginald, to Dinah. Dinah, what is a man doing here? You know I can't bear you to talk to a man. Oh, Reggie, why are you always so jealous? Mr. Quackett is giving the party. What party? Your wedding party. Is he? To Quackett, angrily. I'm much obliged to you, Mr. Quackett. Peggy. Pacifying Reginald. Mr. Quackett is so nice. He calls himself Dinah's uncle. Does he? Then it's a liberty. That's all I can say. Do you know you're in my house, sir? I'm not in your house, sir. Come away, Dinah. Hush. Mr. Quackett is Miss Diots. Be quiet. Mind your own business. Reginald to Quackett. At any rate, it's my business, sir. I'm afraid you're a cub, sir. What? Oh, Reggie, don't! A loud knock and ring are heard. Peggy, to Quackett. Your friend. Whose friend? My friend! Another man, I suppose. Dinah! Ladies, do explain everything to Mr. Pollover. Dinah seizes Reginald's arm. Gwendolyn and Ermatrude gather round them, Reginald protesting. Reginald, handing his card as he passes Quackett. My card, sir. Pooh! Sir. Throwing the card in the fire, the three girls hurry Reginald out of the room. Peggy, to Quackett. I'm so sorry. He hasn't taken to you. He needn't trouble himself. Upon my soul, this is going to be a nice party. Tyler enters. Three gentlemen, sir. I was to say the name of Mallory. Three gentlemen. Peggy, delighted, to quack it. Oh, he's brought some good fellows. Reckoning on her fingers. That's one for Ermintrude, and one for me, and one for... Be quiet. To Tyler. I'll come down. Mallory, outside. Quackett. Yes, Jack? 
Jack Mallory enters. He is a good-looking jovial fellow of about thirty-six, with a bronzed face. He is in evening dress and overcoat. Tyler goes out. Mallory, shaking hands heartily with Quecket. Ah, Quecket, dear old chap. Well, I'm glad to see you. How are you, Jack? Quaint diggings you have up here. A hanging committee have shied you, though, haven't they? Seeing Peggy. I beg your pardon. Quacket, confused. Oh, uh, yes. I didn't mention it. I have my... my... nieces spending Christmas with me. Mallory, bowing to Peggy. Delighted. To Quacket. Did you say niece or nieces? Nieces. Softly to Peggy, quickly. How many? I forget. Three. Three. Three, not counting me. Three, not counting me. I mean three, not counting that vexing girl, Peggy, Margaret. Mallory, bowing. It would be impossible not to count Miss Margaret. Oh. Quacket assists Mallory to take off his overcoat, first darting an angry look at Peggy. Peggy, to herself. I shall give Gwendolen and Ermintrude the two that are downstairs. Hmm. You're not alone, are you, Jack? No, they're coming up. Quacket, grimly. Are they? The old gentleman takes his time with the stairs. Quacket, with forced ease. Poor old gentleman. Who the deuce... The fact is... There's been a big Navy dinner tonight in the Whitehall rooms. The enthusiasm became rather forced. Britannia rules the waves and all that sort of thing. So I gladly thought of finishing up with you. I've brought my nephew. Hello, here he is. Mr. Saunders enters. He is a pretty boy, almost a child, in the uniform of a naval cadet. My nephew. Horatio Nelson Drake Saunders, of the training ship Dexterous. Saunders, with the airs of a little man. How do you do? Awfully pleased to come here. Glad to see you, Mr. Saunders. Mallory, laughing, to Saunders. <laughs> I say, you shouldn't have left the old gentleman. <laughs> he sent me up to count how many more stairs there were. <laughs> Quacket, impatiently. Jack, I don't put the question on theological grounds, but who is the old gentleman? Oh, I beg your pardon, and his. We persuaded an old acquaintance of yours to join us, Admiral Rankling. What? Do you mind? Mind? Rankling, outside. Mr. Saunders! Here, sir. Peggy makes a bolt out of the room. Saunders goes to the door and returns with Rankling. Rankling is in evening dress, overcoat and muffler, and is much out of breath. Oh, Mr. Quackett, how do you do? We haven't met anywhere lately. I've been away, you know. I am delighted to renew our acquaintance, Admiral Rankling. Mr. Mallory suggested that we should smoke our last cigar at your lodgings. I can't stay, for I've a long way to drive home. At least I suppose I have, for I really don't know quite where we are. What quarter of London have you brought me to, Mr. Mallory? Oh, thank you. He turns to Saunders, who is offering to remove his overcoat. The door is slightly opened, and the heads of all the girls are seen. Quacket, hastily, to Mallory. He doesn't know where he is. The fog's as thick as a board outside. He isn't aware he lives a hundred and fifty yards off. No. Does he? Hush, don't tell him. Jack, don't tell him. I'll explain why by and by. Quacket turns to assist Saunders, who, mounted on a chair, is struggling ineffectually to relieve Rankling of his overcoat. Thank you. Bits of boys, bits of boys. Mallory, to himself... There's a wild look about poor Quacket I don't like. It's his lonely bachelor life, I suppose. 
curious place too he used to be such a swell in the albany looking about him the door shuts and the heads disappear rankling to quecket Linky, Linky. Oof. rankling sits down and mallory talks to him saunders has seated himself on the sofa and is dozing off quite tired out Ooh, what a party the door opens and peggy's head appears peggy hurriedly to quecket who'd have thought of this might be worse he doesn't recognize the house he is in doesn't he get rid of his daughter and that horrid pullover certainly not i know he won't recognize his daughter won't recognize his own daughter you drive me mad they continue to talk in undertones saunders is now fast asleep rankling to mallory no i don't like the look of poor quecket he seems altered altered he glares like the devil he's not married is he no then what does he mean by it queer rooms too catching sight of the wedding cake on the table lord look there mallory looking at the cake hello why it's like the thing we had at my wedding breakfast oh i should go no no the fact is poor old quecket has some nieces staying with him nieces four of em i've seen one and i fancy by the look of her mischievous little face that they're too much for him peggy to quecket leave everything to me don't spoil the party uncle dash the party peggy retiring hastily the door bangs at which rankling and mallory look round oh quicket where are your nieces 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 oh they retire at eight o'clock early to bed early to rise gwendolen and ermatrude enter visibly pushed on by peggy rankling rising um this doesn't look like early to bed quecket weakly just got up i suppose gwendolen ermintrude my dears admiral rankling mr mallory looking about for saunders mr mr oh mr saunders is asleep ermintrude and gwendolen advance to rankling rankling to the girls how do you do and whose daughters are you gwendolen and ermatrude look frightened and shake their heads Ooh, these are my sister isabel's girls why all your sister isabel's children were boys were boys yes rankling irritably are boys sir a men now <laughs> hmm. i should have said these are my sister janet's children oh i've never heard of your sister janet no quiet retiring girl janet well then whom did janet marry whom didn't janet marry i mean whom did jane marry why finch griffin of the berkshire royals dear me we're going to meet major griffin and his wife on christmas day at the trotwells are you to gwendolen and ermatrude go away peggy enters oh <clears throat> this is margaret uh, peggy oh another of mrs griffin's yes yes large family rapid two a year rankling eyeing peggy why we've met before today eh where at a miserable school near my house in portland place oh yes our holidays began this afternoon why quicket my daughter dyer and miss griffin are schoolfellows no yes no yes sir how small the world is do you happen to know anything about that person who keeps that school what's the woman's name miss miss 
Miss, Miss, Miss. Miss Diot. Oh, yes. Uncle knows her to speak to. What about her, Quacket? Quacket, looking vindictively at Peggy. Uh, um, rather not hazard an opinion. He hastily joins Mallory, Gwendolyn, and Ermatrude. Rankling, confidentially, to Peggy. Hmm, my dear Miss Griffin, did you receive a short but ample apology for me this afternoon, addressed to the young lady who was shaken? Yes, and oh, I shall always prize it. No, no, don't. You haven't bothered your uncle about it, have you, dear? No, not yet. I shouldn't, then, I shouldn't. He seems worried enough. Shall I take you and your sisters to see the pantomime? Yes, please. Then you'd better give me back that apology. Oh, no. You'd use it again. One, two, three. Mr. Mallory says you have four nieces with you, Mr. Quackett. Ah, oh, but Jack's been dining, you know. I beg your pardon, Jack. Oh, yes, there is one more. Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Parkinson is here with her husband. Hmm. My brother Tankerville's eldest girl. I've never heard of your brother Tankerville. No, he's Deputy Inspector of Prisons in British Guiana. Quiet, retiring chap. I'll go and fetch them. She runs out. Quacket, to Rankling. To make a clean breast of it. The girls have been preparing a little festival tonight in honour of Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Uh, the name Peggy mentioned. My niece was married, very quietly, some weeks ago to a charming young fellow. A charming young fellow. And these foolish children insist on cutting a wedding cake and all that sort of nonsense. I didn't want to disturb you with their chatter. You forget, Quackett. You are speaking to a father. No, I don't, indeed. Peggy re-enters, followed by Reginald and Dinah. My cousin and Mr. Parkinson. How do you... Staring. What an extraordinary likeness to my brother Ned. Taking her hand slowly, still looking at her. And how do you do? Dinah, palpitating. Thank you. I am very well. Do you know your voice is exceedingly like my sister Rachel's? Reginald, thrusting himself between Dinah and Rankling. I am sorry to differ. I think my wife resembles no one but herself. Rankling, hotly. I beg your pardon, sir. Reginald, hotly. Pray don't. Rankling, to himself. That's not a charming young fellow. Peggy, presenting Mallory to Dinah. Mr. Mallory. Mallory, gallantly, to Dinah. I'm delighted to have the opportunity of congratulating my old friend's niece upon her recent marriage. Taking her hand. I think myself especially fortunate in being present on such... Reginald, thrusting himself between Dinah and Mallory and giving Dinah his arm. How do you do, sir? Mr. Mallory, Mr. Parkinson. They bow abruptly, glaring at each other. Mallory, to himself. Is that a charming young fellow? Dinah expostulates in undertones with Reginald, he answering with violent gestures and glaring at Rankling, who mutters comments on Dinah's resemblance to various members of his family. Peggy endeavors to pacify Mallory, who is evidently annoyed, and altogether there is much hubbub, with signs of general ill-feeling. Quackett, sinking back in his chair. Ooh, what a party! Jane enters. Jane, quietly, to Quackett. The pudding is the airy, sir. Why ain't to be paid? I'll come to it. Jane goes out. To Peggy. Margaret. Show Admiral Rankling and Mr. Mallory where the cigarettes are. They may like... 
to himself news are going off my life he goes out peggy to mallory may i take you to the cigarettes mallory to peggy you may take me anywhere oh to rankling the cigarettes are in the next room admiral rankling rankling not hearing peggy but still eyeing dinah what girl has a look of emma's sister susan peggy and mallory go out reginald seeing rankling is still looking at dinah abruptly takes her over to the door glaring at rankling as he passes reginald to dinah fiercely come away dinah dinah to reginald tearfully oh reggie dear reggie you are so different when people are not present they go out rankling watches them through the doorway gwendolen has meanwhile seated herself beside saunders whose head has gradually fallen till it rests upon her shoulder she is now sitting quite still looking down upon the boy's face ermatrude watching them enviously well considering that mr saunders was introduced to us asleep i don't think gwendolen's behavior is comme il faut she bumps gently against rankling oh rankling looking at ermatrude rather dazed my dear i am quite glad to see somebody who isn't like any of my relations come along they go out saunders moves dreamily and murmurs all right my dear i'll come down directly he raises his head and kisses gwendolen then opens his eyes and looks at her startled oh i've been dreaming about my ma i i don't know you do i it doesn't matter mr saunders you've had such a good sleep she kisses his forehead gently oh that's just like my ma where are the others gwendolen arranging his curls upon his forehead i'll take you to them thank you what's your name gwendolen Gwen's short for that, isn't it? Rubbing his eyes with his fist, then offering her his arm. Uh, permit me, Gwen. They go out. Quecket, his hair disarranged, his appearance generally wild, immediately enters, followed by Jane and Tyler. I can't help it. I'm in the hands of fate. Arrange the table. I cannot help it. Tyler and Jane proceed to arrange the table and the seats for supper. Peggy enters, quietly. It is supper time. Oh, what's the matter, Uncle Veer? Well, in the first place, there are no oysters. I've seen them. I've gone further. I've tasted them. Bad. Well, I should describe them as inland oysters. Long time since they had a fortnight at the seaside. Oh, dear. Then we must fall back on the lark pudding. You'll injure yourself seriously if you do. Tell me everything. It has not come small. It has come ridiculously small. It was ordered for eight persons. Then it is architecturally disproportionate. Peggy, to herself. Something must be done. She runs to the writing table and begins to write rapidly on three half-sheets of paper, folding each into a three-cornered note as she finishes it. The girls must be warned. Writing. For goodness sake, don't taste the pudding. Poor girls, what an end to a happy day. Quacket to himself. Oh, if the members of my family could see me at this moment. I, whose suppers in the Albany were at one time a proverb. Oh, Carolyn, Carolyn, even you little know the sacrifice I have made for you. Peggy, to Quecket, handing him the notes. Quick, please, quick, give them these notes. Quecket, taking the notes. What for? Oh, don't ask. You will see the result. But you mustn't write to people you... Go away! He hurries out. Peggy wipes her eyes. Oh, don't be upset, miss. No. I won't. But I am only a girl. 
and the responsibility is very great for such young shoulders there is a murmur of voices outside jane and tyler go out as rankling enters with ermertrude followed by reggie with dinah reginald is endeavouring to keep her away from mallory who comes after them saunders and gwendolen follow next and quecket brings up the rear there is much talking as quecket indicates the seats they are to occupy peggy quietly to quecket did you give the girls the notes quecket surprised no ah never mind i'll whisper to them now she whispers hurriedly to dinah gwendolen and ermertrude quecket to himself i didn't understand they were for the girls he goes to the head of the table as rankling mallory and saunders come suddenly together each carrying a note rankling to mallory mallory we were right there is some horrible mystery about quecket looking to see they are not observed i've had an anonymous warning for heaven's sake don't touch the pudding i know tell the boy mallory to saunders i say don't you say yes to pudding i know tell the old gentleman mallory to saunders he knows to rankling he knows with a simultaneous gesture they pocket the notes and go to find their seats at table they all sit the lobster salad and the pate have been placed by tyler at the end of the table tyler now enters carrying nine large plates which he places before quecket quecket with assumed composure and good spirits there is a spontaneity about our jolly little supper which will perhaps um, atone for any absence of elaboration don't name it mr quecket just as it should be my dear fellow tyler goes out the language of the heart is simplicity our little supper is from the heart ah i shall never forget your little suppers in the albany where were they from gunter's jack with a groan oh jane at the door hands to tyler a very small pudding in a silver basin which he places before quecket rankling mallory and saunders to themselves the, the pudding. pudding they exhibit great eagerness to get a view of the pudding peggy behind mallory's back oh how shameful it looks quecket faltering here is a homely little dish which has fascinations for many though i never touch it myself i never touch it myself rankling mallory and saunders exchange significant looks um, a pudding made of larks he glances round all look down there is deep silence a pudding made of larks to dinah my dear a very little no thank you uncle perhaps you're right gwendolen a suggestion no thank you uncle quacket to peggy margaret i know what your digestion is i won't tempt you to ermertrude ermintrude the least in the world no thank you uncle quacket to himself ah how lucky peggy to herself brave girls i was afraid they'd falter quacket heartily now then admiral rankling no thank ye no pudding i haven't long dined thank you quacket quacket to reginald coldly may i reginald distantly i never ate suppers thank you quacket to saunders my dear mr saunders no mr quacket no thank you quacket getting desperate to mallory jack a lark no thanks old fellow well i throwing down his knife and spoon and leaning back in his chair to tyler take it away tyler removes the pudding they all watch it going tyler handing it to jane keep it warm jane 
jack a lobster salad and a small pate de foie gras are at your end of the table mallory looking round may i there is a general reply of no thank you expressed in symbols by the ladies peggy to herself poor girls what sacrifices they make for these men mallory with a plate in his hand may i rankling saunders and reginald together no, no thank, thank you, you. quacket to himself what a supper party tyler the champagne tyler fetches a bottle of champagne and proceeds to open it rankling behind ermertrude and peggy to mallory if we see the cork drawn shall we risk it risk it risk it reginald has risen from the table and is seen tapping saunders upon the shoulder and speaking to him rapidly and excitedly no i have not talking together reginald and saunders go out hurriedly what's the matter with that charming young fellow now to the table excuse me he follows them out dinah tearfully to gwendolen reginald's jealousy gets worse and worse i am sure it will cloud our future gwendolen to dinah mr saunders wasn't looking at you i am positive the poor little fellow was stroking my hand mallory returns with saunders and reginald who both look excited and their hair is disarrayed reginald to mallory and saunders i beg your pardon i may have been mistaken i imagine that mrs saunders was regarding my wife in a way which overstepped the borders of ordinary admiration they hastily shake hands all around and hurry back to their seats tyler has poured out the champagne and now departs admiral rankling rises quacket taps the table for silence please please Ahem. mallory to himself i thought the old gentleman wouldn't resist the temptation my dear mr quacket it would ill become an old man himself the father of a daughter nearly if not quite of the age of the young lady opposite me to lose an opportunity of saying a few words on the pleasant the the extremely pleasant condition of the british naval forces um no um mallory to himself i knew that would happen pardon me i've been speaking on other subjects tonight. i should say the extremely pleasant occasion which brings us together certainly my dear rankling how nice of you not only am i the commander uh, the father of a ship of a daughter whom it is my ambition to see happily wedded to the man of her choice hear hear quacket in an undertone glaring at her you vexing girl but i am also the husband of a heavily plated cruiser um no of a of a dear hum of a dear lady to whose affection and society i owe the greatest happiness of my life peggy to herself how different some gentlemen are when their wives are not present if i have the regret of knowing that my acquaintance with mrs uh, mrs parkinson thank you i know parkinson has begun only tonight i have also the pleasure of inaugurating a friendship with that delightful young lady which on my side should be little less than paternal i i oh gracious i i cannot sit down mallory wearily <sighs> why not i will not sit down without adding a word of congratulations to mr mr parkinson thank you i know parkinson the young gentleman whose ingenious construction and sea-going qualities no no um whose amiability and genial demeanour have so favourably impressed us 
as an old married man, I welcome this recruit to the service. Hear, hear. It is one of hardship and danger, of stiff breezes and dismal night watches. But it is because Englishmen never know when they are beaten. No, no. Yes, sir, it is because Englishmen never know when they are beaten that they occasionally find conjugal happiness. I ask you all to drink to the Navy, to Mr. and Mrs. Thank you, I know, Jenkinson. All except Dinah and Reginald rise and drink the toast, Mr. and Mrs. Parkinson. Then, as they resume their seats, Reginald rises sulkily. Admiral Rankling? Jane appears at the door, wildly beckoning to Quecket. Sir! Sir! Not now! Not now! Go away! Hush! 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 The girls motion Jane away. She retires. Quecket to Reginald. I beg pardon. All I have to say is that the highest estimation Admiral Rankling can form of me will not do justice to my devotion to my wife. Peggy, sotto voce. Oh, beautiful. Reginald, fiercely. And I should like to know the individual, old or young, who would take my wife from me. Mallory, to himself. Many a husband would like to know that person. In conclusion, as for Admiral Rankling's offer of a paternal friendship, I trust he will remember that offer if ever we should have occasion to remind him of it. Looking at his watch. And now I regret to say. The girls rise. The men follow. No, no, not before we have danced one quadrille. Oh, oh yes. yes. Oh, oh yes. yes. A quadrille. quadrille. Uncle Veer will play for us. No, Uncle Veer will not. Oh, yes, you will, Quacket, old fellow. Eh? Well, I... With pleasure, Jack. To himself. How oh, dare they? Clear the floor. Saunders and Mallory, assisted by Ermertrude and Gwendolen, put back the table and chairs. Rankling, getting very good-humoured, Upon my soul, I never saw such girls in my life. I wonder whether my diner is anything like them. Dinah and Reginald are having a violent altercation. Why should it dance with a husband? It is horrible form. I can't see you let out by a stranger. It is merely a quadrille. Merely a quadrille? Woman, do you think I am marble? Dinah, distractedly, turning to Rankling. Admiral Rankling, are you going to dance? Rankling, gallantly. If you do me the honour, my dear madam. She takes his arm. Reginald, madly, to Dinah. Ah, flirt! Quacket, to Peggy. Get rid of them soon, or I shall become a gibbering idiot. Mallory, slapping Quacket on the back. Now then, Quacket. Quacket goes to the piano. To Peggy. Will you make me happy, dear Miss Peggy? Thank you, Mr. Mallory. I never dance. Taking his arm. But I don't mind this once. Uncle. Quacket to himself. I wash my hands of the entire party. He plays the first figure of a quadrille while they dance. Rankling and Dinah, Saunders and Gwendolen, Mallory and Peggy, Ermertrude and Reginald. They dance with brightness and animation, but whenever Reginald encounters Dinah, there is a violent altercation. As the figure ends, Jane enters again, and runs to Quecket at the piano. What is it? Oh, sir, do come downstairs, as far down as you can get. What do you mean? That boy, Tyler, sir. Tyler? Well? He went off bang in the kitchen, sir, about ten minutes ago. Them fireworks. Fireworks? Where is he? Gone for the engines, sir. Quacket, rising. The engines? Uncle. Uncle Veer. Now then, Uncle. Excuse me. Let somebody take my place at the piano. I, uh, I'll i be back in a moment. Jane hurries out. 
he following her. Peggy, running to the piano and commencing a waltz, A waltz, change partners. Rankling dances with Ermatrude, Saunders with Gwendolen. Reginald is left out, but is wildly following Dinah, who is dancing with Mallory. Not so fast, Miss Griffin, not so fast. Reginald, in Dinah's ear, I shall require some explanation, madam. A Reginald! There is the sound of a prolonged knocking at the street door, followed by a bell ringing violently. Peggy, playing. Somebody wants to come in, evidently. Suddenly the music and the dancing stop and everybody listens. Then they all run to the windows and look out. What's that? What's wrong? Oh, look there. Oh, there's such a crowd at our house. Quacket re-enters with Jane, who sinks into a chair. Quacket looks very pale and frightened. Listen to me, please. What's the matter? What's the matter? What's the matter? What's the, What's the matter? What's the matter? What's the matter? What's the matter? Don't be alarmed. Look at me. Imitate my self-possession. What is the matter? What is the matter? What is, is the, matter? the matter? What is the matter? What is the matter? What is the matter? What is the matter? The matter. The weather is so unfavorable that the boy Tyler has been compelled to display fireworks on the premises. Oh! oh. What, what has, has happened? happened? Pray, don't be disturbed. There is not the slightest occasion for alarm. We now have the choice of one alternative. What's, What's that? that? To get out without unnecessary delay. The girls, clustering together. Oh! oh. Rankling, assuming the tone of a commander. Mr. Murray! Mr. Saunders! Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Mallory and Saunders place themselves beside Rankling. Ladies, fetch your cloaks and wraps preparatory to breaking up a pleasant little party. Who volunteers to assist the ladies? I, sir. I, sir. I do. I do. Mr. Mallory, tell off Mr. Quirt and Mr. Jenkinson to help the ladies. The girls run out, followed by Reginald, Quacket, and Jane. Mr. Murray, Mr. Saunders. Yes, yes sir. sir. All respective coats. They bustle about to get their coats as the door quietly opens, and Jaffrey, a fireman, appears. Good evening, gentlemen. Can you tell me where I'll find the ladies? They're putting on their hats and cloaks. Thank you, gentlemen. I'm much obliged to you. He goes to the window, pulls up the blind, and throws the window open. The top of a ladder is seen against the balcony. Are you coming up, Mr. Goff? Goff, out of sight. Yes, Mr. Jeffrey. Goff, a middle-aged, jolly-looking fireman, enters by the balcony and the window. Gentlemen, Mr. Goff, one of the oldest and most respected members of the brigade. Mr. Goff tells some most interesting stories, gentlemen. Rankling, impatiently. Stories, sir? Call the ladies, Mr. Murray. Mallory goes out. I shouldn't hurry them, sir. Ladies like to take their time. Now, I remember an incident in October 78. Confound it, sir! You're not going to relate anecdotes now! I beg your pardon, sir. Mr. Goff is one of the most experienced and entertaining members of the brigade. I told you I don't care about that just now. Where are the ladies? Saunders goes out. Excuse me, sir. Mr. Goff's reminiscences are well worth hearing while you wait. But I don't wish to wait. Mallory and Peggy, Saunders and Gwendolen, Reginald and Dinah, followed by Jane, enter. The girls are hastily attired in all sorts of odd apparel and carrying bonnet boxes, parcels, and small handbags. Ermatrude carries, amongst other things, a cage of white mice, Gwendolyn a bird in a cage, and Dinah a black cat, and Peggy a pair of skates and a brush and comb. We're, We're ready. Take, take us, us away. away. I must really ask you, ladies and gentlemen, to take it quietly for a few minutes. Take, take it quietly. quietly. Take what it for? quietly. Take it what for? Take it quietly. What for? Take it quietly. What for? What for? 
the staircase isn't just a thing for ladies and gentlemen at the present moment. I shall have to ask the ladies and gentlemen to use the escape. All turning to the window. The escape? The escape? Where, the escape? Where is it? Where, Where is it? The escape? The escape. The escape. Where, Where is, is it? it? It'll be here in two minutes. In the meantime, I think Mr. Goff could while away the time very pleasantly with a reminiscence or two. Ladies, Mr. Goff... Oh, oh, take, take us away. away! Take, take us, us away. away! Mallory, Saunders, and Reginald sue the ladies. Jaffrey goes to the window and looks out. Goff, pleasantly seating himself and taking off his helmet. Well, ladies, I, I don't know that I can tell you much to amuse you. However... Be quiet, sir. We will not be entertained. Jaffrey, carrying a hose from the window to the door. Really, gentlemen, I must say I've never heard Mr. Goff treated so hasty at any conflagration. He carries the hose out. A fireman full of anecdote? I decline to appreciate any reminiscence whatever. So do we all. Certainly. All of us. It was in July 79, ladies. My wife had just brought my tea to the Chandler Street station. Jaffrey re-enters and goes to the window. Will you be silent, sir? Get up and do something. Go away. The escape, ladies and gentlemen. That window, one at a time. There is a general movement and hubbub. Goff rises. He and Joffrey disappear by the window on the left. Mallory throws open the other window, and Jaffrey appears outside, and receives Dinah, Gwendolyn, Ermatrude, Peggy, and Jane as they escape. Mr. Mallory! Mr. Saunders! Good evening. Reginald disappears by the right-hand window. Saunders goes after him. Mallory is about to follow when Quecket enters hurriedly. Quecket is in a tall hat, a short covert coat, and carries gloves and an umbrella. He is flourishing a letter. Quecket, pulling Mallory back. Jack! Jack! Hello. I'm going back to save some valuables. Directly you get down, post that letter. Oh, Jack, it's so important. Mallory, looking at the letter. To the Eagle Fire Insurance Company. Quite so. Slipped my memory. Mallory disappears. Jaffrey follows him. Rankling, hurrying to Quecket. My dear Quecket, it is the commander's duty to be the last to leave the ship. You are master here. Thank you for your hospitality. Good night. My dear Rankling, thank you for coming to see me. Good night. Jaffrey appears at the window. It's all right, gentlemen. There's a kind lady down below who is taking everybody into her house for the night. Mrs. Rankling of Portland Place. Mrs. Rankling? That's my wife. Quacket disappears. Is she, sir? Glad to hear it. Then they are all your visitors till tomorrow. Confound it, sir! Where do I live? Just at the corner here, sir. A hundred yards off. Then where am I now? Miss Diet's boarding school, sir. Valumnia College. What? He and Jaffrey go out by the window on the right as Goff enters by the window on the left. Where is he? Calling at the door. Sir, here's the lady of the house. Rode up on an engine from Piccadilly. Make haste. She says she will come up the ladder. Quacket enters quickly, dragging after him several boxes of cigars. A lady? What lady? Miss Diot peers at the window. She is in the gorgeous dress of an opera bouffe queen, with a flaxen wig much disarranged and a crown on one side. Recoiling, Caroline! Miss Diot, entering and taking him by the collar, Come down. She drags him towards the window. End of the second act. Act Three of The Schoolmistress by Arthur Wing Pinero. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
The Third Act The Nightmare The scene is a well-furnished, tastefully decorated morning room in the house of Admiral Rankling. At the further end of the room there are two double doors facing each other, one with glazed panels opening to a conservatory, the other to a dark room. There are also two doors near to the pillars that support an archway spanning the room. All is in darkness, save for a faint glow from the fire, and a blue light coming through the conservatory windows. Peggy, dressed as before, enters quietly, looking about her. Where have I got to now, I wonder? What a dreadful wilderness of a house to wander about in, in the dark, all alone. Oh, for the daylight. Looking at her watch. Half past six. Why, gracious, here's a spark of fire. Oh, joy. She goes down on her knees and replenishes the fire with coal from the scuttle. The door opens and Gwendolyn peeps in. What room is this? Entering noiselessly. Will the day never break? Frightened and retreating as Peggy makes a noise blowing up the fire. Oh! Oh, who is that? Looking around. Gwendolyn? Peggy! Are you wandering about too? Yes, I can't sleep. Can you? Peggy, shivering. Sleep? No. As if I could sleep in a strange bed in a strange house, in one of Admiral Rankling's nightgowns. You didn't meet any daylight on the stairs, did you? Another door opens, and Ermatrude enters noiselessly. Gwendolyn, clinging to Peggy. Oh, look there! Ermatrude, in a whisper. I wonder where I am now. Ermatrude. Ermatrude, clinging to a chair. Ah! Be quiet. It's we. It's us. It's her and me. Oh, my grammar's going now. Can't you girls get to sleep? I should think not. There wasn't any daylight in your room when you came down, was there? I thought I saw a glimmer through the window on the first floor landing. Ah, perhaps that's some of yesterday's. I know. I've made up the fire. Let us bivouac here till daybreak, two by the fire, and take it in turns for the sofa. Picking up a bearskin rug and carrying it to the sofa. Who's first for the sofa? Oh, Ermintrude. Gwendolen. Come along, Gwendolen. Gwendolen puts herself upon the sofa, and Peggy covers her with a bearskin. There, as soon as you drop off to sleep, it will be Ermintrude's turn. Looking through the conservatory doors. Oh, how the snow is coming down. Joining Ermintrude, who is warming her hands by the fire. She sits in an armchair. Peggy, do you know what has become of poor Dinah? Yes, she's locked up, upstairs, till the morning. Admiral Rankling locked her up. Gwendolyn, from the sofa. It's a shame. Go to sleep. Oh, what a scene there was. Admiral Rankling foamed at the mouth. It was lucky they got Mr. Quackett away from him in time. Where is Mr. Quackett? Go to sleep. Ermatrude, leaning against Peggy's knees. Mr. Quackett is locked up too, isn't he? Of course he is. Till the morning. Miss Diot locked him up. Very properly, I think. And where's Miss Diot? Upstairs, in the room next to mine. In hysterics. Hush. I do believe Gwendolen has gone off. Are you pretty comfortable? Ermatrude her head on Peggy's lap. Yes, thank you. <sighs> the door quietly opens, and Saunders appears. Peggy and Ermatrude are hidden from him by the armchair. I can't sleep in my room. Where have they put Uncle Jack, I wonder? Seeing Gwendolyn, who is sleeping with the light from the conservatory windows upon her. Oh, what's that? Going softly up to Gwendolyn and looking at her. Why, here's my Gwen. I wonder if she'd mind my sitting near her. Turning up his coat collar and sitting gently on the footstool, he leans against the head of the sofa drowsily. Now if any robbers wanted to hurt Gwen, I could kill them. Closing his eyes wearily. Oh. Soon there is a sound of heavy regular breathing from the four sleeping figures. 
The door opens, and Mallory enters. Mallory, shivering. Ugh. Can't get a blessed wink of sleep. Where have I wandered to? Why, this is the room where the awful row was. Seeing Gwendolen. Hello. Here's one of those schoolgirls. Discovering Saunders. And, well, this nephew of mine is a devil of a fellow. That isn't a glimmer of a fire, surely. Walking toward the fireplace, he nearly stumbles over Ermatrude. More girls. He accidentally knocks over the scuttle. They all wake with a start. What's, What's that? that? Who, Who is, is it? it? Hush. Don't be frightened. It's only I. Mr. Mallory. I've been wandering about. Can't sleep. No, we can't sleep either. Well, I don't know about that. Ermatrude lights the candle on mantelpiece. Why haven't you and Mr. Saunders gone home? You're not burnt out. Perhaps not, but Admiral Ranklin asked me to remain. And if he hadn't, I'm not going to leave this house till my friend Quecket is out of danger. Out of danger? Yes. Are you aware that you young ladies have brought very grave difficulties upon that unfortunate gentleman? Peggy, crying. He encouraged us. He's a man. Now, pray don't cry, my dear miss. What is your name this morning? Hesleridge. And I wish I'd never been born. Hesleridge. And you wish you'd never been born. Taking her hand. Well, Miss Hesleridge, the serious aspect of the affair is that Admiral Rankling has a most violent, ungovernable temper. Peggy, tearfully. I know. I've never seen a gentleman foam at the mouth before. It's quite a new experience. Of course. Of course. And therefore, I'm apprehensive for poor Mr. Quecket's bodily safety. Meanwhile, I won't disturb you any longer. Come along, Saunders. Where are you going? To the front door. To speak a word or two of encouragement to that young fellow, Paulover. Oh, is he outside still? In the snow? Why? He's been walking up and down on the other side of the way all night. And you haven't let him in? How could I? You forget that our host has forbidden him the house. No, I don't. I saw them roll out on the road together. Girls, shall we open the front door, or shall we remain the mere slaves of etiquette? Well, I should like to let him in. Certainly, why not? Come along. I know the way. Saunders, Gwendolen, and Ermatrude go out quietly. Mallory to Peggy. Well, you'll perhaps pardon my saying that you are a devil-may-care little schoolgirl. You make a great mistake. I am not a schoolgirl. I am struggling to be a governess. Ah, I hope you'll make your way in your profession. Peggy has discovered the spirit stand on the sideboard and now places it on the table. What are you going to do now? Brew poor Mr. Palover something hot. Bringing the kettle and spirit lamp to the table. Light this lamp for me, please. He lights the lamp. If you can recommend me at any time to a lady with young daughters, I shall be grateful. I will. I will. I think I am almost capable of finishing any young lady now. I am sure you are. Looking at the spirit lamp. Is that a light? They put their heads down close together to look at the lighted lamp. That's all right. Seems so. They rise and look at each other. We'd better watch it, perhaps, in case it goes out. They bob down again with their heads together and both sit on the same chair. You'll get into an awful scrape over your share in last night's business, won't you? Frightful. The thought depresses me. 
do you think Miss Diote, or Mrs. Quackett, or whatever she is, will send you home? She can't. She's got me forever. She took me years ago for a bad debt. How can she punish you, then? I think she will withdraw her confidence from me. You won't despair, will you? I'll try not to. What a jolly little sailor's wife you'd make, brewing grog like this. I hope I should do my duty in any station of life to which I might be called. I'm a sailor, you know. No, are you? Mallory, taking her hand and putting it to his lips. You know I am. Peggy, suddenly. It's going to boil over. They jump up quickly. Mallory retreats. Oh, no, it isn't. Gwendolen and Ermatrude enter, leading Reginald, with Saunders following. Reginald is in a deplorable condition, covered with snow and icicles. His face is white and his nose red. Oh, poor Mr. Pullover. He's frostbitten. Thaw him by degrees. Peggy mixes the grog. Gwendolen and Ermatrude lead Reginald to a chair before the fire, he uttering some violent but incoherent exclamations. He's annoyed with Admiral Rankling. The girls chafe his hands while he still mutters, with his eyes rolling. It's a good job his language is frozen. Putting the glass of grog to his lips... Reginald, reviving. Thank you. Take my hat off, please. I bought it from a cabman. Gwendolyn removes his hat, which is very shabby. Good morning. Where's my wife, Dinah? She's quite safe. I must see her. Speak to her. You can't. She's locked up. Then uh, I must push a long letter under her door. She must... She shall know that I am going to walk up and down outside this house all my life. Bring writing materials. I'll hunt for the pen and ink. So will I. Reginald to Peggy. No, no, you do it. These men are bachelors. They can't fear for me. Here's a writing table. Peggy runs to Mallory and opens the lid of the writing table. Note paper and envelopes. Where's the... Opening one of the small drawers, she starts back with a cry. Oh! They all turn and look at her. What's, What's the, the matter? matter? Peggy, taking from the drawer a large bunch of keys, each with a small label, which she examines breathlessly. Duplicate keys of all the rooms in the house? What gross carelessness! To leave keys in an open drawer? Girls, why should not we impress this fact upon Admiral Rankling by releasing Dinah immediately? Oh, oh yes, 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 yes. Reginald, seizing Peggy's hand. Oh, Miss Hesseridge, my father-in-law is entertaining an angel on a waist. Oh, stop, stop, stop. I don't think we're quite justified. I told you he was merely a bachelor. Pointing to Saunders. So is his companion. Give me the keys. No, no, I take responsibility of this. I am a girl. Going towards the door and looking at Mallory and Saunders as they make way for her. I hope you will repent your line of conduct, gentlemen. She goes out. I think we all shall. There is a sudden noise, as of someone falling down a couple of stairs. They start and listen. Oh. oh! What's that? Ermatrude, looking out at door. Here's Admiral Rankling. There is a suppressed exclamation with a silent scamper to the further end of the room. What the deuce does a respectable man want out of bed at this unearthly hour? Rankling, in a rage, outside the door. Confirm that! Oh! oh. Reginald, opening the door leading to the dark room... Here's the room here. Shall we condescend to hide? Yes. 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 They disappear hastily as Rankling appears in a dressing gown, his face pale and his eyes red and wild. Hello? Someone's been sitting up. Candles and a fire. Ah. Sniffing and walking about the room, 
he goes straight to the mantelpiece upon which Reginald's grog has been left, and takes up the tumbler. It's Mallory. With suppressed passion. It's against the rules for anyone to sit up in my house. But I don't mind Mallory. I don't. Looking at Sofa. Hello. Mallory's been turning in here. Going to the sofa and sitting there shaking with anger. Are we never to have any more daylight? How long am I to wait till that miserable schoolmistress releases the worm Quacket? Quacket! Uncle Fair! The reptile who has made a fool of me in the eyes of my wife and daughter. Ah, but I must husband my strength for Quacket. I have been a very careful man all my life. As far as muscular economy goes, Quicket shall have the savings of a lifetime. Lying down and pulling a rug over him. Uncle Fear! Ah, I was a wild, impetuous, daring lad once. Going to sleep. And I can be unpleasant, even now. I can. The Admiralty doesn't know it. Emma doesn't know it. Quicket shall know it. He breathes heavily. The others have been peeping from their hiding place, and as they close the door, Peggy enters alone, quickly but silently. She looks for the others, then almost falls over rankling on the sofa, at which she retreats with a suppressed screech of horror. Mallory opens the further door and gesticulates to her violently to be silent. Peggy, petrified, Oh, my goodness gracious. Mallory comes and bends over Rankling, listening to his breathing. He then goes to Peggy. He's dropped off. Where is Mrs. Pallover? She's not on that side of the house. I have a plan for disposing of the old gentleman. Try the other side. I'm going to. Turning and clutching Mallory. But, oh, Mr. Mallory, what do you think I've done? That's impossible to conjecture. I've made a mistake about the doors, and I have unlocked Mr. Quicket. She goes out quickly. Mallory thinks for a moment, then bursts into a fit of silent laughter. <laughs> I love that girl. Reginald appears at the further door, gesticulating. Where is my wife? I can't live longer without her. Where is Dinah? Hush. She'll be here in a minute. Come out of there and lend me a hand. Saunders, Gwendolyn, and Ermatrude enter on tiptoe. To Reginald. Now then, gently. Mallory and Reginald each take an end of the sofa and carry Rankling out through the door into the dark room. If they bump him, all's lost. Mallory and Reginald reappear. I feel warmer now. Turn the key. Reginald turns the key as Dinah and Peggy enter cautiously. Dinah! Dinah! Reggie! My wife! Reginald rushes down to Dinah and embraces her frantically. There is a general cry of relief as Mallory embraces Peggy, and Gwendolyn throws her arms around Saunders. Suddenly, there is the sound of someone stumbling downstairs, accompanied by a smothered exclamation. All, listening, What's that? What's that? What's that? What's that? What's that? Ermatrude, peeping out at the door, Here's Uncle Veer got loose. He's fallen downstairs. Oh, bother. Come along, Dinah. Reginald and Dinah, Saunders, Ermatrude, and Gwendolyn go out quickly. Peggy to Mallory. Rather bad taste of your nephew and those girls to run after a newly married couple, isn't it? Yes. We won't do it. No. But... We don't want to be bothered with your old friend Quicket, do we? No, he's an awful bore. Is the conservatory heated? Peggy, taking his arm. I don't mind if it isn't. They disappear into the conservatory. The door opens, and Quicket, his face pale and haggard, enters, still wearing his hat and the short covert coat over his evening dress and carrying his gloves and umbrella. To whom am I indebted for being let out? Was it by way of treachery, I wonder? Somebody has been sitting up late or rising early. Who is it? 
sniffing and looking about him, then going straight to the mantelpiece, taking up the tumbler and smelling the contents. I'm anxious not to do anyone an injustice. But that's Peggy. Oh, what a night I've passed. I have no hesitation in saying that the extremely bad behaviour of Caroline, of the lady I have married, and the ungovernable rage of Rankling, are indelibly impressed upon me. Looking round nervously. Good gracious! I am actually in the room where Rankling announced his intention of ultimately dislocating my vertebrae. I shall certainly not winter in England. The clock strikes seven. He looks at his watch. Seven. It will be wise to remain here till the first gleam of daylight, and then leave the house unostentatiously. I will exchange no explanations with Caroline. I shall simply lay the whole circumstance of my injudicious boyish marriage before my brother Bob and the other members of my family. Any allowance which Caroline may make me shall come through them. There is a sound of something falling and breaking outside the room. The deuce! What's that? Going on tiptoe over to the door and peeping out. Somebody has knocked something over. Snatching up his hat, gloves, and umbrella. I shan't wait till daybreak if they're breaking other things. He hurries to the other door, opens it, looks out, and closes it quickly. People sitting on the stairs. Is this a plot to surround me? The conservatory? He goes quickly to the conservatory doors, opens them, and then draws back, closing them quickly. Two persons under a palm tree. There is a knock at the door on the right. Oh! Seeing the door leading to the dark room. Where does that lead to? He tries the door, unlocks it, and looks in. A dark room. Oh, I'm so thankful. He disappears, closing the door after him. The knocking outside is repeated. Then the door opens, and Miss Diot enters. She is dressed in her burlesque queen costume. Her face is pale. She carries the head, broken off at the neck, of a terracotta bust of a woman. I have broken a bust now. It is an embarrassing thing to break a bust in the house of comparative strangers. Oh, will it never be daylight? Does the milkman never come to Portland Place? I have been listening at the keyhole of Veer's room. Not a sound. He can sleep with the ruin of Volumnia College upon his conscience while I... Sinking into a chair. Ah, I realize now the correctness of the poet's observation. Uneasy lies the head that wears a crown. Quackett comes quietly from the dark room, much terrified. Rankling's in there, asleep. In the dark I sat on him. Oh, what a narrow escape I've had. Coming behind Miss Diot and suddenly seeing her. Caroline! Scylla and Charybdis! He bolts back into the dark room. Miss Diot, rising, alarmed. <gasps> What's that? Mrs. Rankling enters in a peignoir. I heard something fall. Seeing Miss Diot. Mrs. Quicket. Distantly. Instructions were given that everybody should be called at eight. I had arranged that a more appropriate costume should be placed at your disposal. Seeing the broken bust. Ah! What has happened? I knocked over a pedestal. Mrs. Rankling, distressed. Oh, bust of myself by belt. I saw him working on it. Oh, Mrs. Quicket, is there no end of the trouble you have brought upon us? The trouble you have brought upon me? What? Why didn't you tell us you had a husband? Why didn't you tell me that Dinah had a husband? We didn't know it. Well, if you didn't know your own daughter was married, how can you wonder at your ignorance of other people's domestic complications? But that's not all. You have informed us that you are now actually contributing to a nightly entertainment of a volatile description, that you are positively being laughed at in public. Isn't it better to be laughed at in public and paid for it 
than to be sniggered at privately for nothing mrs quackett you are revealing your true character it is the same as your own an undervalued wife let me open your eyes as mine are opened we have engaged to love and to honour two men i have done nothing of the kind i mean one each oh excuse me now looking at him microscopically is there much to love and to honour in admiral rankling um he is a genial after-dinner speaker <laughs> it is true he is rather austere an austere sailor all bows abroad and stern at home well then knowing what occurred last night is there anything to love and to honour in mr quackett nothing whatever miss diot annoyed and yet he is undoubtedly the superior of admiral rankling very well then do as i mean to do put your foot down if heaven has gifted you with a large one so much the better the voices of quackett and rankling are heard suddenly raised in the adjoining room quackett my dear rankling veer the admiral has released your husband i'll trouble you sir certainly rankling come away and i will advise you bring your head with you miss diot and mrs rankling carrying the broken bust hurry out as quackett enters quickly followed by rankling admiral rankling i shall mark my opinion of your behaviour through the post sit down thank you i've been sitting i sat on you on the sofa sit down quackett sits promptly was an old friend of your family mr quackett i am going to have a quiet chat with you on family matters rankling wheels the armchair near quackett quackett to himself i don't like his calmness i don't like his calmness rankling sits bending forward and glaring at quackett how is your sister janet quite well eh tell me without a moment's delay sir how is janet permit me to say admiral rankling that whatever you're standing with other members of my family you have no acquaintance with the lady you mention oh haven't i drawing his chair near quackett very well then is griffin quite well finch griffin of the berkshire royals i do not know how major griffin is and i feel i do not care oh you don't very well then drawing his chair still nearer quackett will you answer me one simple but important question if it be a question a gentleman may answer certainly how often do you hear from your brother tankerville oh rankling clutching quackett's knee he's deputy inspector of prisons in british guiana you know doesn't have time to write often does he admiral rankling you will permit me to remind you that in families of long standing and complicated interests there are regrettable estrangements which should be lightly dealt with affected you have recalled memories rising excuse me rankling rising no sir i will not excuse you where are my gloves because mr quackett i have your assurance as a gentleman that your brother tankerville's daughter is married to a charming young fellow of the name of parkinson now i have discovered that parkinson is really a charming young fellow of the name of paulover so that as paulover has married my daughter as well as tankables paulover must be prosecuted for bigamy 
and as you know that paul over was parkinson and parkinson paul over you connived at the crime inasmuch as knowing paul over was tankerville's daughter's husband you deliberately aided parkinson in making my child dinah his wife but that's not the worst of it oh because i have since received your gentlemanly assurance that tankerville's daughter is my daughter now either you mean to say that i've behaved like a blackguard to tankerville which will be a libel or that tankerville has conducted himself with less than common fairness to me which will be a divorce and in either case without wishing to anticipate the law i shall personally chastise you because although i've been a sailor on the high seas for five and forty years i have never during the whole of that period listened to such a yarn of mendacious fabrication as you spun me last night quacket beginning to carefully put on his gloves it would be idle to deny that this affair has now assumed its most unpleasant aspect. Admiral Rankling, the time has come for candour on both sides. Be quick, sir. I am being quick, Rankling. I admit, with all the rapidity of utterance of which I am capable, that my assurances of last night were founded upon an airy basis. In plain words, lies mr quackett a habit of preparing election manifestos for various members of my family may have impaired a fervent admiration for truth in which i yield to no man rankling advancing in a determined manner very well sir quackett retreating one moment rankling one moment if not two i glean that you are prepared to assault to chastise well to inconvenience a man at whose table you feasted last night do so i will do so i say do so but the triumph when you kneel upon my body for i am bound to tell you that i shall lie down the triumph will be mine you are welcome to it sir put down that umbrella what for i haven't an umbrella you haven't allow me to leave this room my dear rankling and i'll beg your acceptance of this one rankling advances fiercely quacket retreats miss diot enters carolyn stop admiral rankling if you please any reprimand physical or otherwise will be administered to mr quacket at my hands I would have preferred rankling. Rankling, I could have winded. He goes out quickly, Miss Diot following in pursuit. Veer. I am in my own house, madam. Mrs. Rankling enters, carrying the broken bust. Emma, go to bed. Archibald Rankling, attend to me. Don't roll your eyes, but attend to me. Emma! your tone is dictatorial it is meant to be so because after seventeen years of married life i am going to speak my mind at last holding up the head before him archibald look at that what's that myself less than ten years ago the sculpture's earliest effort broken made of bad stuff send it back it is your memory i wish to send back ah oh, archibald do you see how round and plump those cheeks are people alter you were stout then i was in those days i was thin frightfully very well then the average remains the same 
Some day we may return to the old arrangement. If you ever find yourself a spare man again, Archibald, it won't be because I have worried and fretted you with my peevish ill humour. Emma! As you have worried and worn me with yours. Emma, you have completely lost your head. She raises the broken bust. I don't mean that confounded bust. That was an ideal. And if a mere sculpture could make your wife an ideal, why shouldn't you try? So, understand me finally, Archibald, I will not be ground down any longer. Unless some arrangement is arrived at for the happiness of dear Dina and Mr. Paul Over, I leave you. Leave me? This very day. Wantonly desert your home and husband, Emma? Yes. Covering his face with his handkerchief. And I don't know where to put my hand upon even a necktie. And the world shall learn how highly you thought of Dina's marriage at Mr. Quackett's party last night. Oh. And what a very different man you have always been in your own home. And take care, Archibald, that the verdict of posterity is not that you were less a husband and father than a tyrant and oppressor. Quackett enters, with Miss Diod in pursuit. She follows him out. Veer. Rankling blows his nose and wipes his eyes, and looks at Mrs. Rankling. Emma! Emma! Oh, dear! Oh, dear! Emma! Don't tuck your head under your arm in that way! She puts the broken bust on the table. Emma! There have been grave faults on both sides. Yours I will endeavor to overlook. Ah, now you are your dear old self again. But Emma, you are occasionally an irritating woman to live with. You are the first who has ever said that. So I should hope, Emma. And poor Dina? You will forgive her? On condition that she doesn't see Paul Over's face again for five years. Oh, there will be no difficulty about that. Reginald and Dinah enter. She is dressed for flight. Papa! My father-in-law! They retreat hastily. Who let you out? Who let you in? He goes out after them. Mrs. Rankling follows. Archibald, continue your dear old self. Quackett enters by another door, Miss Diot following him, both out of breath. They look at each other, recovering themselves. I understand that you wish to speak to me, Carolyn. Oh, you, you paltry little man. You mean, ungrateful little creature. You laced-up little heap of pompous pauperism. You, you, I cannot adequately describe you. Wretch. Quackett, putting on his gloves again. Have you finished with me, Caroline? Finished with you? I shall never have finished with you. Never, till you leave me. Quackett. Rising. Till I leave you? Till you leave me a widow. Quackett, resuming his seat, disappointed. Oh. You don't think I expect you to leave me anything else? Oh, what could I have seen in you? I take it, Caroline, that in the language of the hunting field, you scented a gentleman. Scented a gentleman? In the few weeks of our marriage, I have scented you, and cigaretted you, wined you, and liquored you, tailored, and hatted, and booted you. I have darned, and mended, and washed you, gruelled you with a cold, tinctured you with a toothache, and linimented you with the gout. Have I not? Have I not? You certainly have had exceptional privileges. Familiarity appears to have fulfilled its usual functions, and bred... 
the most utter contempt have i not paid your debts not at my suggestion and all for what i assume for love's dear sake carrie for the sake of having the vestal seclusion of alumnia college telegraphically denominated as bachelor diggings any collection of young ladies may be so described the description is happy but harmless as for the subsequent conflagration don't talk about it i say with all sincerity that from the moment the fire broke out till i escaped no one regretted it more than myself that was tyler tyler what tyler i make no historical reference when i say what tyler was it who abruptly tore aside the veil of mystery which had hitherto shrouded the existence of champagne and lobster salad from four young girls it was you no it wasn't carrie upon my word <laughs> upon my honour <laughs> those vexing pupils played the very devil with me after you left the pupils as it were dilated yes and you ordered them champagne glasses i suppose oh deceiver you talk of deception what about the three o'clock train from paddington it was the whole truth there was one but you didn't travel in it what about the clergyman's wife at hereford go there you will find several but you're not staying with them oh carrie how can you meet my fearless glance when you recall that my last words yesterday were cabman drive to paddington the lady will pay your fare i cannot deny that it is by accident you have discovered that i am queen honorine in otto bernstein's successful comic opera and what do you think my family would think of that it is true that the public now know me as miss constance de la porte oh miss constance de la porte the new and startling contralto her first appearance and have i a quacket after all gone and married a conny you have it is true too that last night while you and my pupils were dilating i was singing i and at one important juncture dancing no no not dancing madly desperately hysterically dancing and to think if there was any free list that my brother bob may have been there but do you guess the one thought that prompted me buoyed me up guided my steps and ultimately produced a lower g of exceptional power no the thought that every note i sang might bring a banknote to my lonely veer at home carrie i went through the performance in a dream the conductor's baton beat nothing but veer 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 into my eyes someone applauded me i thought ah that's worth a new hat to veer i sang my political verse a man very properly hissed he has smashed veer's new hat i murmured at last came my important solo i drew a long breath saw a vision of you reading an old copy of the rock by the fireside at home and opened my mouth i remembered nothing more till i found myself wildly dancing to the refrain of my song the audience yelled with approbation i bowed again and again and then tottered away to sink into the arms of the prompter with the words beer catch your carry but my family my brother bob what have they ever done for you while i it was my ambition to devote every penny of my salary to your little wants and isn't it no veer albany butte quacket it isn't the moment i dragged you down that ladder last night and left behind me the smouldering ruins of volumnia college 
I became an altered woman. Then I will lay the whole affair before my family. Do, and tell them to what your selfishness has brought you, that where there was love there is disdain, where there was claret there will be beer, where there were cigars there will be pipes, and where there was pool there will be kino. Oh, why didn't I wait and marry a lady? You did marry a lady but scratch the lady and you find a hard-working comic actress be silent madam <laughs> this is my revenge veer quacket to-night i will dance more wildly more demonstratively than ever i forbid it you forbid it you dictate to constance de la porte the hit of the opera i am queen honorine she slaps her hands and sings with great abandonment and in the pronounced manner of the buffo queen the song she is supposed to sing in bernstein's opera reen reen honorine mighty weather wife a queen firm a ruler never seen and reen reen la i will write to my married sisters do and i will call upon them man's a boasting fretting fumer smoking alcohol consumer quick of temper ill of humour oh you shall sing this to my family i will with her hands upon her hips woman has no pet devices cuts her sins in good thick slices with a smile that's sweet and nice is mm. refrain singing and dancing reen reen on the reen mighty weather wife or queen firm a ruler never seen and reen reen la <laughs> she sinks into a chair Ooh, i will tell my brother of you daylight appears through the conservatory doors mrs rankling and dinah enter mallory and peggy enter from conservatory spooning my dear mrs quacket i owe everything to you my treatment of the dear admiral has had wonderful results what do you think the admiral and mr polover are quite reconciled and understand each other perfectly rankling and polover enter glaring at each other and quarrelling violently in undertones look the admiral already regards him as his own child Saunders, Ermatrude, and Gwendolen enter and join Peggy and Mallory. But we are to be separated for five years. Oh, Reggie, you trust me implicitly, don't you? I do, and that is why I warn you never to let me hear of you addressing another man. Oh, Reggie. They embrace. Don't do that. You don't see me behaving in that way to Mrs. Rankling, and we've been married for years. Mrs. Rankling to Dinah. But you and Mr. Polover are to be allowed to meet once every quarter. Yes, in the presence of Admiral Rankling and a policeman. Mrs. Rankling, Rankling, Dinah and Reginald join the others. Otto Bernstein enters quickly and excitedly, carrying a quantity of newspapers. I beg your pardon. I must see Miss Constance Delaport. I mean Miss Diot. Mr. Bernstein your house is burned down it does not matter you have made a great hit in my new art i mean my gomic opera i have been walking up and down fleet street waiting for the babers to come out handing round all the newspapers their dimes their telegraph their daily news their standard the Bost, the Chronicle. They are all complimentary except one, and that I give to the cabman. Miss Diot, reading. Miss Delaporte, a decided acquisition. Go on. Quacket, reading. Miss Delaporte, an imposing figure. What do they know about it? Go on, go on. I always say I do not read the papers, but I do. To Miss Diot. You will get fifty pounds a week in my next oratorio. I mean my comic opera. 
fifty pounds a week my carry i shall be able to snap my fingers at my damn family how very pleasing reading a voice of great purity a correct intonation and a lower g of decided volume rendered attractive some music not remarkable for grace or originality bernstein takes the paper for mrs rankling i did not see that i will give that to the gabman good-bye i cannot stay i am going to have a turkish bath till the evening papers come out i always say i do not read the evening papers but i do he bustles out mrs quicket i shall book stalls at once to hear your singing oh no emma dress circle stalls archibald rankling glaring dress circle stalls archibald or i leave you for ever very well emma i have no desire but to please you i take this as a great compliment my dear rankling carrie and i thank you but i can't hear of it i insist on offering you both a seat in my box your box quacket softly to her hush carrie my darling your veer's private box mr quacket's private box during my absence at night will be our lodgings where he will remain under lock and key peggy laughs at quacket <laughs> oh you vexing girl excuse me my dear quacket but while looking at the plants in the conservatory i became engaged to miss hesleridge there is a general exclamation of surprise ah coward you haven't to wait five years jane enters oh if you please ma'am tyler 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 wants to know who's to pay him the reward for being the first to fetch the fire engines last night i will no i will tyler has rendered me a signal service he has demolished volumnia college from the ashes of that establishment rises the phoenix of my new career miss diod is extinct miss stella port is alive and during the evening kicking i hope none will regret the change i shall not for one while the generous public allow me to remain a favorite end of act three end of the schoolmistress by arthur wing panero